Hello everyone and welcome to Accommodations for Care of Patients of Size, one of 10 webinars hosted by the Facility Guidelines Institute on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. I'm Heather Livingston, Director of Operations for FGI and Managing Editor of the 2022 edition of the Guidelines, and I'm excited to be your moderator during today's webinar. FGI is pleased to host this series of continuing education webinars developed to broaden understanding of the Guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AIA credit, you'll need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. Now it's my honor to introduce today's presenters. Mary Matz is a board certified professional ergonomist and an internationally recognized expert in patient care ergonomics. Her expertise led to the inclusion of safe patient handling building design criteria in the 2010 FGI guidelines. She was the primary author of Patient Handling and Movement Assessments, a white paper giving direction and providing assistance to design professionals when incorporating patient care ergonomics into healthcare design. She assisted in the development of the safety risk assessment included in the 2014 guidelines and was co-chair of the group that developed patient handling criteria for patients of size in the 2018 guidelines. She currently provides safe patient handling consultation related to technology and building design requirements in addition to research and program implementation and maintenance. Joe Strauss is a Director of Planning and Design at the Cleveland Clinic, where he is responsible for renovation and new construction of the system's facilities, including the 160-acre main campus, nine regional campuses in Northeast Ohio, other U.S. locations, and international locations. He's been at the Cleveland Clinic for 10 years and prior to that spent 18 years as a partner in healthcare consulting firms. Joe is a member of the American Institute of Architects, the Academy of Architecture for Health, and the American College of Healthcare Architects. He's been a member of the FGI Health Guidelines Revision Committee since 1992. Welcome Joe and Mary, and thanks so much for being with us today. Hello, and thank you for joining us today to learn what's new in regard to accommodating our increasing number of patients of size. The following slides will provide background information on patients of size, patient handling equipment, and projecting facility needs for patients of size. I will then discuss the provider's perspective of the new language. My co-presenter, Joe Strauss, will take it from there and discuss the new requirements from the designer's perspective. As we all know, unfortunately, obesity has been on the increase for many years. On this 2014 map provided by the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, Brown signifies that over 35% of the people in these states are obese. Orange indicates 30 to 35%, yellow 25 to 30%, and then we have the few green states with 20 to 25% obesity rates. And we used to think that that was high, Unfortunately, the trend continues. These data show that in 2014, 70% of U.S. adults were overweight or obese. Fewer than 30% were not. As you can see, obesity has three classes, class one, class two, and class three. Class three includes bariatric people. Note that in 2014, 7.7% were clinically considered true bariatric patients. According to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, by 2030, half, half of Americans will be considered obese if trends continue as they are. 
We can see here how weights of U.S. adult men have changed over the past few decades. Going from left to right, you see the lighter weights starting at the 5th percentile, moving to the heavier weights, ending at the 95th percentile. Comparing the date ranges of 1988 to 1994, with 2011 to 2014, in each percentile the weight increases. The bottom row of white numbers shows the percent increases in weight at each percentile. The fifth percentile weight increased by around 4%. As you follow the percentiles to the right, the increase gets larger and larger with an 11.5% increase at the 95th percentile. The bottom line is that all are getting heavier, but the heaviest patients are getting even heavier. Increasing weights is certainly problematic, especially when you see these data. Obesity was the primary or secondary diagnosis for 2.8 million hospitalizations in the U.S. in 2009. And hospital admissions related to obesity tripled from 1996 to 2009. These trends continue with the increasing weight. I'd now like to explain the difference between bariatric patients and patients of size. The term bariatric is usually thought of when you think about weight loss surgery, but it's also used to describe patients who are limited in health, mobility, or environmental access because of their weight and or size. An example, example of limited environmental access is a patient of size whose bed is too large to pass through the door of a patient room. When doorways are too small for the full width of an expanded capacity bed, the bed is taken into the patient room disassembled, broken down. When it is assembled and the patient is on the bed, the patient is basically trapped in their room if an emergency occurs. Other stories abound related to not being able to move a patient of size from his room for a procedure or an x-ray. Design must include doorways wide enough to allow entry and exit of beds required for these patients of size. In recent years, the term patients of size is being used as an alternative to the term bariatric. Why do we prefer patients of size? Bariatric is a clinical term defined as shown on the slide. When considering patients of size ergonomically, we prefer to use thresholds related to the weight of the patient, those greater than 300 pounds, and other factors rather than BMI. The BMI used when dealing with ergonomic thresholds is usually 30 as opposed to 40 used in clinical practice. Another reason is that the term patients of size is found to be less offensive to those patients. So when you look at the bodybuilder and the person we think of as obese, you would re really never believe their BMIs are the same, but they are. As previously noted, obesity has health ramifications that are usually not present in those who are not obese as the bodybuilder. We would never consider the bodybuilder to be a bariatric person. The term patient of size is used for obese, morbidly obese, and bariatric people, but importantly, it also includes tall, muscular, and big people who don't have medical conditions related to their weight and whose body composition does not have a high percentage of fat. For ergonomic or safe patient handling and mobility purposes, the focus is on the patient's weight, their height, and the distribution of their weight. You will see that 300 pounds or greater is used as the threshold for identifying patients of size in the FGI guidelines. Patients of size need more help. They need more caregivers when moving, handling, and ambulating, and generally caring for them. 
The equipment they use is larger. We call this equipment expanded capacity equipment. And even when patient handling equipment is being used to move, lift, or mobilize patients of size, there are greater risks of injuries for caregivers. With expanded capacity equipment and larger patients and more caregivers, more space is required in patient rooms, bathrooms, treatment rooms, exam rooms, and other areas that serve patients of size. The next several slides will relay patient handling equipment necessary for the care of patients of size. Patient lifts are categorized as overhead lifts and floor-based lifts. We're starting with overhead lifts. These lifts are for dependent, extensive assistance, and partial assistance patients. And there are two main types of overhead lifts, the ceiling-mounted lifts, and wall-mounted lifts. Most people are familiar with the ceiling-mounted style, but the wall-mounted design overcomes many issues found when renovating existing facilities, such as dealing with ceiling-mounted lights, AC diffusers, as well as pipes and AC ducts above the ceiling. Overhead lifts are the gold standard for patient handling. Staff are more efficient when they use these, and they are more compliant in their use compared to other equipment. The overhead lifts can be used to assist staff in performing more patient care tasks than any other equipment, and they require less space in rooms than other lifts. Many think they are only for lifting patients, but as you can see, they are used for an assortment of patient care tasks and slings that are used in conjunction with these lifts are what gives overhead lifts their variability in use. I think of the lift motor as the workhorse and the slings as the devices that actually help perform specific patient handling tasks depending on the patient needs. Later, I will show you a variety of slings. Expanded capacity lifts have a few designs. Some use a double motor with each motor lifting, say, four or 500 pounds, and other designs have a single motor with various weight capacities, maybe 800 or 1,000 pounds. Floor-based lifts also protect caregivers, but not to the extent that overhead lifts do. Caregivers must push and maneuver these and much more space is needed to safely move and turn patients, especially large patients. I personally don't recommend their use unless there is absolutely no other way to move a 400 pound plus patient. There are a few designs with motorization capabilities, but not many in use presently. And there are two types of floor-based lifts. One is a sit to stand lift and the other is a full body sling lift. We're going to start here with the full body sling lifts. They have most of the functions of overhead lifts. These photos show a typical bed to chair transfer, left center, their use in ambulating patients, top right, and how the mobile lifts can be used for assisting in vehicle exit and entry. These are used, again, for dependent, extensive assistance, and partial assistance patients. As noted earlier, specific slings assist in various patient handling tasks. The ambulation slings seen here assist in ambulation training and strengthening. It's used for amputees and stroke patients. The repositioning sling can be left on the bed, and when caregivers need to rotate a dependent patient every two hours, they simply untuck the repositioning sheet and attach it to the overhead lift to roll or move the patient up in bed or side to side. They don't need to go to find additional caregivers to help. The strap or limb support sling is used for that but also for laterally rolling dependent patients. A facility I worked in had an 800-pound patient in their ICU, 
and staff were totally unable to roll the patient to the side to dress wounds or clean him. Thank goodness the lift representative showed staff how to use the strap slings to roll him over his side. When he left the hospital, he had lost hundreds of pounds and he certainly would not have left the hospital if it weren't for the lift and these slings. The Panna sling basically holds up the tissue and fat in the abdominal area of an obese person. Just picture staff holding up this panis if the sling were not doing it. An extremely, extremely high risk task. This shows the use of a friction-reducing device to facilitate sling insertion. Another floor-based lift, the sit-to-stand or standing assist lift, is used for partial assistance patients who have some weight-bearing capability, who can grasp with at least one hand, who have upper body strength, and who are cognitively able to follow simple commands. These lifts are used for a myriad of activities other than transfers, such as toileting, dressing, diapering, and others. Some sit-to-stand lifts have a design that allow patients to ambulate without fear of falling, the photograph on the far right. There are also non-powered sit-to-stand lifts that require more patient capabilities. All floor-based lifts take up space in the patient room and other locations, and storage must be considered, especially for expanded capacity floor lifts with larger footprints. There are many other expanded capacity patient handling equipment that are necessary for patients of size, such as motorized rolling equipment, with adjustable beds, and these are important because of the variety of shapes of patients of size. For instance, a 400-pound apple-shaped patient would need less width than a 400-pound pear-shaped patient. Expanded capacity exam table and exam expanded capacity commodes. If a toilet does not have the weight capacity for a patient of size, an expanded capacity rolling commode can be placed over the toilet to allow for privacy. Bottom line, the large size and shape of expanded capacity patient handling equipment must be taken into account when designing rooms and storage locations. Structural adequacy must also be addressed. The next topic I'm going to address is one that will facilitate having the right equipment, furnishings, and other necessary materials to make caring for patients of size easier for staff and more comfortable and safe for patients of size, as well as exhibiting sensitivity for their unique needs. To make sure the design for patients of size is appropriate, during the planning phase, again, during the planning phase, the design team should work with facility staff to obtain the projected weight capacities of the populations to be served. If a new facility is being designed, CDC obesity rates can be helpful. From this information, the number of rooms required for patients of size and the number of expanded capacity overhead lifts required can be determined. The guidelines suggest a 300 pound threshold to determine the number of rooms needed for patients of size. In an existing facility with historical data, be sure to capture data by clinical unit, not facility wide. And it and include at least one year of data. Collect the average number of patients heavier than 300 pounds admitted each week on a specific unit. Collect the average length of stay on the specific unit for those patients over 300 pounds and review the CDC obesity rates for the specific geographical area. 
to project the number of patient rooms required for new construction with no historical data available, use CDC obesity data for the geographic region where the hospital will be built. For example, if CDC data shows 30% of the population in the geographic area are over 300 pounds or have a BMI greater than 30, and it is a 200-bed hospital, then 60 patient rooms or 200 bed times 30% should be designated for patients of size. When considering how many expanded capacity lift devices are required in these 60 rooms, use the same method of data collection for determining the number of rooms, but use a higher weight capacity. A facility should use the weight capacity of their existing or planned overhead lifts to make an estimate. For example, if the weight capacity of the standard facility lift is 550 pounds and the facility estimates that 5% of the patients of size population will be over 550 pounds, then 5% or three of the 60 rooms will need expanded capacity lifts for those few patients over 550 pounds. The FGI guidelines uses 600 pounds as an example, but again, the actual weight capacities of the standard or proposed lifts should be used for calculation purposes. Again, projecting future facility needs for patients of size are based on facility and or CDC data. The CDC provides obesity data based on geographical location, then drills down by age, gender, ethnicity, and other factors. This information can be used in projecting weight capacities for the specific population to be served. Additionally, such planning should include the review of current codes and local regulations, as well as an understanding of the unit patient population. There are a few ways to locate the obesity data on the CDC website. This is the home page for CDC overweight and obesity data. One way to find your data is to click on adult overweight and obesity on the far right lower side. This is the bottom half of the page you will be taken to in order to find obesity and overweight data. You will select the state you're interested in from the left drop down box and select the category and topic obesity weight status from the right drop down boxes. Then you would click go on the map side of the page. As a reminder, see that overweight and obese are different classifications. Overweight people have a BMI of 25 to 29.9%, while obesity is a BMI greater than 30%. 650 pounds is the maximum weight used in the CDC data. This slide shows the first page of obesity and overweight data. The data on the right is for those 18 years or older who are overweight, while the data on the left is for those who have obesity. CDC also provides obesity and overweight rates for adolescents and for WIC two to four year olds. These are children involved in a special federal supplemental nutritional program for women, infants, and children, WIC. These data may be useful when design involves pediatrics. Take a look at the data set on the right. The first data you will see will give you data on the most recent year, 2016, to determine what category to view you select from total, age, education, gender, income, and race or ethnicity. 
The blue bar tells us that in 2016, approximately 34% of adults age 18 years and older have an overweight classification. When you look at the data set on the left, you will see a graph depicting all of the data, the total data, because that's what's been selected from the drop-down menu for all available years. This slide shows the same data as in the previous CDC data slide. In both obese and overweight, all available years are selected and the view is by the total number and trends can be seen. Trends can be important in estimating needs for patients of size. These data are relatively flat with a slight increase in obesity in obese adults. When you are using CDC data to project facility needs for patients of size, compare the two weight designations and go with the larger of the two numbers. Be sure to have adequate room for those patients of size who are considered obese. For construction in Mississippi, design professionals should consider having 37% of the rooms for patients of size. Of course, regional variations must be taken into account. Obesity rates in metropolitan areas are usually less than in rural areas. Now, what are the providers' perspectives on these new changes? Mobility is medicine. Early patient mobilization is a key and a critical strategy in the healing process, and this new language supports this. So what is mobilization? It's the frequent moving, ambulating, and careful positioning of patients. Even moving totally dependent patients up in bed or side to side is considered mobilization. The following video clip will exhibit how the use of ceiling lifts foster early mobilization and all of its benefits. And thanks to the Cleveland Clinic for allowing us to use this. One of the interventions that we're really working on here is to get patients up and out of bed and moving and normalizing their day as soon as possible. For Brent, we felt it was safe for him to get out of bed. We approached him and said, just that, how would you like to get out of bed? And he sort of had this bright look on his face, but then he became very concerned. They put him in the sling underneath of him and lifted him up out of bed and put him in a chair. It's a lift mechanism that comes down, it has a bar. We put a very strong sling underneath him that connects to the lift and then we lift him up. And it's really important to describe all of that to patients so that they understand what's about to happen to them. I felt so safe and secure seeing him being lifted and put into a chair. And I realized how important it is to be upright, to breathe, and how quickly he got so much better. It was actually something I looked forward to, getting out of bed, sitting in a chair. You could just see the improvement day by day. It was leaps and bounds. That's how quick things happen mm -hmm. from my first chair trip to ventilator off to going to rooftop. That's how quick it all happened. Is Mr. Boyle a wonderful success story? Yes, he is. But every patient is a candidate for the kind of care that this care path is prescribing because we know that this is the right care to provide to every patient, every family. And it's the right thing to do for every caregiver, not only to, to help them have the tools to mobilize our patients, but to do so safely. We've had caregivers say, wow, I knew that mobilizing my patient was the right thing to do and I got to provide the type of care that I wanted to provide. I went home today feeling like I did a good job. Patients of size are seen in healthcare settings with many medical conditions, as you just saw in this video. When there is adequate space and appropriate equipment, they can be properly mobilized, resulting in the positive outcomes seen on this slide. Reduced risk of pneumonia and UTIs, fewer falls, and less skin breakdown. An extremely important take-home message is that patients cannot
be adequately mobilized without necessary patient handling equipment and without equipment caregivers are injured. As the new guidelines do, including lifts in adequate numbers that traverse into toilet rooms and ensuring appropriate patient handling clearances, will decrease injury risk for caregivers and patients in addition to providing improved quality of patient care. Patient safety cannot be adequately addressed if employee safety is not adequately addressed. Now, we'll look into the impact on caregiver safety. Patient handling tasks conducted without assistive devices greatly increases the risk of injury for caregivers, and when caring for patients of size, the risk is much, much, much greater. In this study on caring for patients of size, morbidly obese patients with BMIs greater than 35 were only 10% of the patient population studied at the time of the research. But care of these patients resulted in nearly 30% of the injuries, 28% of the injuries in which the caregiver was not able to go back to work for a period of time, and 37% were unable to perform their normal nursing duties. The researcher concluded that manual patient handling without equipment resulted in much greater risks of injuries. Also, and importantly, the greater risk of injuries was related to inadequate planning for patients of size, including lack of appropriate design. Another recent study found that caregivers with no patient handling equipment had much more pain in the upper extremities than those that had some equipment and those with all the equipment they needed. Also, caregivers who frequently performed patient handling tasks on patients of size had significantly more back pain than those who did not. Interestingly, caregiver injuries were also related to having enough bariatric and non-bariatric equipment. Other predictors of caregiver injuries were related to adequate clearances for moving patients and time to use patient handling equipment, which is related to accessibility and storage, all that are addressed in the new language Now, how are organizations impacted by caring for patients of size and the, de the new design criteria? Caring for patients of size increases costs related con to construction, equipment, and other materials. It also increases costs related to staffing and caregiver injuries. But when patient handling equipment Necessary space and storage are included in patient care areas. Costs for negative patient and staff outcomes decrease. Including patient handling equipment and other safety features in design also support facility and regulatory requirements. John Salona is internationally known for his work in decision analysis, a very high-level form of cost-benefit analysis. Through his work in hospitals, he found that the amount of money invested in patient handling equipment was related to caregiver compliance and use of equipment. I have also seen this, and in purchasing few patient handling devices, just does little good. For instance, if a facility puts overhead lifts in half of the patient rooms on a unit, more likely than not, they will eventually go unused the majority of time. But when a lift is readily available in every room, staff tend to use the equipment on a regular basis. It's because it's there. There are many other reasons for this, but an optimal investment 
will produce positive outcomes for patients and staff and reduce costs for the organization. This graph compares the use of floor lifts with ceiling lifts or overhead lifts in relation to time spent preparing for a patient transfer and the transfer itself. Use of ceiling lifts significantly reduced time for these tasks. The cited study relayed that improvements in staff efficiency benefit quality of care. These are outcomes for patients who are not obese. The impact should be much greater for patients of size. These case studies show how investments at Stanford Hospital and Intermountain Healthcare resulted in organizational savings. Stanford achieved a $2.2 million five-year net savings after investing only $800,000 in purchasing patient handling equipment and developing a program. The reduction in costs came from significant reductions in patient pressure injuries and workers' compensation claims from patient handling injuries. Intermountain Healthcare saw a 45% reduction in patient falls and a 42% decrease in caregiver injury rates in the first year of their program. They estimated there would be a half million dollar savings per year from just reducing employee injuries. Thank you so much for your attention. I will now turn the presentation over to Joe Strauss. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. The 2018 guidelines have a number of changes related to patients of size, including advisory information and specific design requirements. This will help designers understand the design issues and it allows them multiple ways to meet the requirements. As an architect, I do not view the requirements as a restriction, but as an enabler. Patients of size is first mentioned in section 1.2, planning, design, construction, and commissioning. Key points in 1.2-6.4 include, first, the needs for patients of size shall be defined in the planning phase early in the process, and secondly, Requirements apply to all areas designated for patients of size, including travel to those areas. In section 2.1, common elements for hospitals, specific design requirements are defined in 2.1-2.3. There is also a reference to patient handling and movement assessment requirements. The FAMA, as it is often referred to, is part of the safety risk assessment. It is the responsibility of the facility owner or governing body to provide the design team with the safety risk assessment, including the FAMA. The FAMA includes two phases. Phase one, the patient's needs assessment, including equipment and location requirements. And phase two, design considerations. This is more about design awareness with the specifics such as clearances and dimensions in section 2.1. The FGI Health Guidelines Review Committee assigned a bariatric task group to work on these particular standards. The group included patient handling experts, clinicians, and architects. Mary and I were part of this group. The group participated in a workshop at the Hillrom Customer Experience Center. We worked with a mock-up of a patient room which had two movable walls so that the width and length could be changed. Multiple simulations of patient handling and transfers were performed. Let's take a look at a few of the simulations that inform the guideline requirements. These will be graphically illustrated in diagrammatic floor plans. We will look at the following. First, a transfer from bed to wheelchair using a ceiling lift and then a floor base lift. Then a transfer from bed to stretcher using a ceiling lift. And finally, a transfer from bed to toilet using a sit to stand lift. 
First, the bed to wheelchairs transfer using a ceiling lift. Most of our illustrations show two caregivers, although at times more may be necessary. This transfer requires a clear floor area of five feet from the side of the bed to the wall and 10 feet, six inches parallel to the bed, starting two feet from the head wall. You will see this two, 10 feet, six inch dimension fairly consistent as we go through the next few simulations. As you will see in other simulations, the five foot dimension will not be the minimum dimension that you will want to use for design. Here the caregiver is assisting the patient into the lift. The lift is shown in an XY configuration with two primary rails along the side of the bed and one traversing rail over the bed. This type of lift provides maximum flexibility in moving the patient. Here the patient is transferred from the bed to the lift. And now the patient is successfully transferred to the wheelchair. The next simulation we will look at is a bed to wheelchair transfer using a floor based full body sling lift. This transfer requires a clear floor area of seven feet from the side of the bed to the wall. And again, 10 feet, six inches parallel to the bed, starting two feet from the head wall. The illustration shows the caregivers bringing the mobile lift into the room. Here, the caregivers assist the patient onto the lift. Here, the patient is, is in the lift and moved away from the bed. Because of the size of the lift and the space the caregivers need to maneuver it, seven feet is required from the side of the bed to the wall. Here, the caregiver successfully transfer the patient from the lift to the wheelchair. The third simulation is a lateral transfer from bed to stretcher using a ceiling lift. This transfer requires a clear floor area of five feet, six inches from the side of the bed to the wall, and 10 feet, six inches parallel to the bed starting two feet from the head wall. Note, that the ceiling lift clearance from the side of the bed to the wall is one foot six inches less than required for the floor-based full body sling lift. That means about 20 square feet less floor space is required, which could be a significant construction cost savings. This illustration shows the caregivers bringing the stretcher into the room. Here, the caregivers are maneuvering the stretcher into position. Note that in this illustration, there are five caregivers shown. The number of caregivers required is based on many variables, including patient size and medical condition. The important thing to consider is that several caregivers is not uncommon and they require a space to work. Here, the patient is prepared for transfer. Now the patient is transferred from bed to stretcher. The stretcher with the patient is now maneuvered out of the room. Let's review the clearances around the bed. Five feet at the foot, five feet six inches on the non-transfer side, and on the lateral transfer side, five feet six inches with the ceiling lift, and again, seven feet with the floor base full body sling lift. The last simulation we will review is a bed to toilet transfer using a sit to stand lift. This transfer requires a clear floor area of five feet from the side of the bed to the wall and 10 feet, six inches parallel to the bed. In this illustration, the caregivers are assisting the patient into the lift. Here the patient is in the lift and movement toward the toilet begins. Caregivers and patient continue toward the toilet. Caregivers begin to prepare the 
patient for the transfer, the clearance required in front of the toilet is an area three feet, 10 inches wide and six feet long. Here the transfer to the toilet is made. Caregivers are positioned on both sides of the toilet. Note that for patients weighing 600 pounds or more, a ceiling or wall mounted lift system is required to transfer the patient from the bed to the toilet. With an expanded capacity toilet, 36 inches are required from the center line of the toilet on both sides. With a regular toilet, the dimensions increase to 44 inches to accommodate a commode over the toilet. This picture is an example of an over the toilet commode. That completes our look at various types of transfers, the use of different lifts, and clearances required. Now, let's look at a few other design requirements for accommodating patients of size. In bathing facilities, shower stalls are to be at least four feet by six, in, six feet. Grab bars are to support 800 pounds and a handheld spray nozzle is to be provided on the sidewall. Exam and treatment rooms with expanded capacity exam tables require specific clearances. Five feet at the foot, non-transfer side, and transfer side for a sit-to-stand lift or an overhead lift. However, if a mobile full-body sling lift is to be used, then seven feet is required on the transfer side. Supporting the patient's weight is a critical design issue that can be easily overlooked. Special attention needs to be given to plumbing fixtures, handrails, grab bars, and furniture. Extra space will typically be needed for storage, driven by the need for more equipment and large equipment. Waiting areas require space for large seating and circulation. Larger door openings are required for expanded capacity equipment. Expanded capacity wheelchairs require a minimum door opening of 45 and a half inches. Inpatient rooms require 56 inch, 57 inch door openings. In summary, the 2018 guidelines provide a great resource for developing healthcare facilities for patients of size. It provides the users with a greater understanding of patients of size. Today, we reviewed the definitions of patients of size and a bariatric patient. A greater awareness of issues and needs related to patients of size. Insight into patient handling risk to patients and caregivers. Today, we discussed injury rates. A comprehensive approach to patients of size requirements and advisory information for projecting patient population and room need. Today, we reviewed resources available to help project need. The guidelines also provide consolidated design criteria, specific clearances to accommodate patient handling, movement, and mobilization, implications, of patient lift types to accommodate patient handling, movement, and mobilization, and insight into the benefits of appropriate patient handling for patients and caregivers. This concludes our prepared presentation. Thank you so much for that presentation, Joe and Mary. And now we've got a few follow-up questions for you. Question number one. It would appear that using four base lifts would be much less expensive than installing overhead lifts throughout a facility. Why do the guidelines seem to focus on overhead lifts so much, even with the extra cost? Well, this is Mary's. Um, I'll start answering that. Um, floor based lifts have many uh, design features that 
are difficult to accommodate in a patient room, um, such as with you, when you have a bed, a patient bed, oftentimes there isn't room to put the floor base under the um, the bed because the height of the um, the base of the floor lift is is too high, and so that's an issue. But even more so, when you have floor base lifts, they are not in the patient room. They are usually in a storage room down the hall. And oftentimes when I would walk through facilities um, and I would ask where their floor base lifts are, they're bariatric and they're non-bariatric, um, I would find them way back in the storage room and a lot of times with a layer of dust on them. And the problem would be accessing them. And the caregivers would put things that they use frequently in front of them. And then when they would go down the hall to find the lift and see the lift far into the back of the storage room, they would just decide to find somebody else and do this task they were needing to do um, manually. And the manual tasks are the ones that end up creating injuries for not just the caregivers, but for the patients as well. And so from a an ergonomic standpoint, uh, we look at that, uh, that we don't want our caregivers uh, using manual methods. Um, but also we have found that um, using overhead lifts in the patient room and throughout a facility, that there is more compliance and with more compliance, there's a reduction in the um, number of injuries and the risk of injuries to caregivers and to, to patients. And so all of this really funnels into cost savings for one. And I think Joe can probably also talk about cost savings as far as clearance goes, which we were he just spoke to. Well, yes, uh, Mary, there's certainly a consideration on the construction side. As we saw in the simulations, the floor base lift actually takes more square footage. We estimated about 20 square feet more. And with the high cost of hospital construction, uh, that's, a, that's a considerable cost, which could offset the cost of putting in a ceiling lift. So um, there's pros and cons to it, but certainly um, the cost difference that you might think there is is probably a lot less. And uh, we would recommend that you kind of do your own analysis on your project, but um, there's certainly benefits uh, with reducing the, the floor uh, square footage with the ceiling lift. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next question, where did the 300 pound threshold for patients of size come from? It seems that there are a lot of people over 300 pounds, which would mean a lot of rooms would need to be added. Is that your interpretation as well? Uh, this is Mary, and yes, um, there it would mean there would be many more patient rooms for patients of size. Uh, where that came from, though, was from the literature, from research, but uh, as importantly, in our group, that we pulled together for the FGI to study patients of size. We had two experts in bariatric patients of size um, information, and that was their recommendation and also the recommendation uh, that we found in the literature. Okay. It seems that some patients of size requirements could affect many areas of the hospital. Is that correct? This is Joe. Uh, let me um, answer that and Mary can add to it. Um, that's correct. Um, it's important to understand where patients will be seen and treated when you're planning and designing a facility. And uh, those areas need to be designed to accommodate those patients. So if they are going to a patient room or to surgery or to an imaging area, um, you, you have the patient 
of size and all the weight and you you simply have to be able to take care of them and accommodate your caregivers also in moving those patients so consideration needs to be uh, taken taken into account for all the areas where the patients are taken now on the other hand if you're a small hospital and you you are not treating bariatric patients uh, you know those areas more may be more limited if you have transfer policies or whatever and that's all to be discussed and looked at at project initiation and in the planning phase and during the risk assessment and and uh, when when the pharma is is uh, written so um, that that is definitely uh, something to consider as you're designing the facility and this is Mary again and I totally mirror what Joe has just said I will mention that in let's say um, outpatient clinics um, if you're looking at some of those or some um, even at, um, as part of, of a hospital system that a, a you might not need uh, as many bariatric rooms as uh, you would think you would because you could always use a um, a treatment room and have that for patients of size and not as many of the the um, the, the the exam rooms so there are some ways to to capture what you need and have adequate uh, care for your patients of size, but you do, it doesn't mean you have to have a ceiling lift for a patient of size or for a patient in every single room. It, it can be adapted and specific areas selected where this is where we're going to take care of the patients of size at all times. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. There seems to be some difference between the patients of size and ADA dimensions. How can the designer resolve these differences? Oh, that's a good observation and question. Uh, there are there are differences, and ADA is is a federal law, so that needs to be complied with. Um, in some cases, the the differences um, simply are differences, and you can't you can't meet both of them. But I think probably um, the area that we run into most often is, is in a toilet room and the dimension from the center line of the toilet to the wall. And uh, so you have a choice. You can, you can design a bariatric toilet room or you can design an ADA toilet room. Or the other possibility is to uh, use a, a grab bar uh, use the dimension for the for the bariatric patient, and then you use a grab bar that can fold down for use to meet the ADA requirement. And of course, this should all be reviewed with the authority having jurisdiction uh, in the area where the facility is being designed. Please remember to see the person who registered your site at the close of the session. That person will receive an email with a webinar survey or report form and a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar. The form needs to be completed by each registered attendee in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. Here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. We hope you'll be able to join us for each presentation. Keep current with what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the 2022 revision cycle by signing up for our quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or following us on LinkedIn. Thank you for joining us, and thanks to our presenters, Mary Matz and Joe Strauss. Have a great day, everyone.